Hello, everyone. Welcome to the report Secret Sauce of ECAT MCAT Collaboration Webinar. I'm Grace. I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Altium. Along with us, Nikolai, the Product Manager of MCAT Co-Designer, is here to help answer any questions you may have regarding the product. And I'm thrilled to have the privilege to introduce our special presenter today, the brilliant minds behind the BattleBots team, Rebot. In modern engineering, the harmony between ECAD and AMCAD has become the cornerstone of uh, groundbreaking innovations. And today, Team Rebot is to, going to show us how they utilize AMCAD co-designer in Altium 365 to collaborate between ECAD and AMCAD, sharing valuable insights and best practices. And by the end of the session, you get a deeper understanding of the tools, strategies, and the mindset required to harness the full potential of ECAT MCAT collaboration in your own projects. So let's welcome Team Rebot. Hi, David. Hello, thanks for having us. Hi, Nick. Hi, guys. And hi, Cam. Hi, everyone. We're so happy to have you here to share your experience with the audience. And congratulations on making a top four at the BattleBots World Championship this season. So without further ado, the stage is yours, and everyone, enjoy your webinar. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Grace. Uh, like she said, uh, we are Team Ribot from the uh, TV show BattleBots on Discovery Channel. Um, I have here with me today uh, my lead electrical, Nick, as well as my lead mechanic. We'll be talking about uh, what the TV show is and how we began as a team. Um, we'll be going into how custom electronics set us apart from the rest of our competitors. And um, we'll be sharing exactly how we moved from some other software that we we're using previously towards Altium 365 um, for better integration. And then uh, after that, we'll go through a very brief demo on our workflow using Altium Code Designer. Um, and then we'll end with a quick Q&A. Um, so to start things off, what exactly is BattleBots? Uh, BattleBots is a combat robotics competition on the Discovery Channel. We compete in the 250 pound weight class. Uh, we're often told that these robots don't look nearly as big on TV as they do in real life. Um, and each match is a three minute battle to the death. Um, so this past season on BattleBots, there were 50 teams from around the world um, and we film in Las Vegas over the course of two and a half weeks. Uh, I know the TV show makes it sound like we film throughout the year, but they definitely don't give us that luxury. Um, the filming schedule is extremely aggressive and the teams are um, working at um, the hardest they can the entire time. Uh, the arena we compete in is 48 feet by 48 feet and is completely bulletproof. Uh, these robots are extremely dangerous and for the safety of the competitors and the spectators, uh, the box has to be extremely robust. Um, but instead of me uh, telling you about what BattleBots is, here's a quick example of, I think, our best fight to date. Look out! Oh! Black Dragon getting underneath Ribot. Oh. Landing some nice shots, but Ribot coming right back. Black Dragon inverted. Oh! What a shot by Ribot! Whoa! Oh, that place, that place, that place. They have him inverted, Chris. This is a good opportunity for Ribot. Whoa! And now they're back on their belly after Whoa. that latest shot by Ribot. And Black Dragon's delivering a shot. What a nasty brawl so far, Chris. Just 30 seconds into the fight. Uh oh. Oh boy. Rimon pushing Black Dragon into the screws of the upper deck. Can he get him up? Can he get him up? Rimon continues to play the aggressor. David Jin is looking for a knockout here. Black Dragon won't go down easy. Oh, oh my goodness. David Jin talked about his confidence. You can understand why. Oh! Big time counter shot by Black Dragon. Their drive is compromised on that left side, Chris. Ribot needs to put them away. You cannot let Black Dragon hang around. They will make you pay. Only been knocked down once in 26 career fights, and Black Dragon's weapon is still spinning, and it is still dangerous. Absolutely, with the power of these two weapons, one shot can change this fight in an instant. Ribot trying to get a good angle. Oh, oh another shot by Ribot. Oh, oh, oh. And a follow-up. Black Dragon stunned by that shot. Now just teetering on Ribot's tire. The Brazilian's tire is no longer spinning, Kenny. Have they lost the drive altogether? That's the big question. Yeah, Black Dragon is hurt. Their weapon is still spinning. Ribot backs away. They think they have the knockout. 
They are not moving. Count up! Count up! David Jin calling for a countdown. Whether Black Dragon stuck or incapacitated, yeah, they're yeah, simply running yeah. out of time. Oh, oh. The countdown has started. Black Dragon still unable to move. Ribeye within seconds straight upset to advance to the round of eight. Um, so what we just watched was actually our top 16 match from the season. So uh, having won this match, we were able to advance onto the top eight. Um, this is really huge for uh, our team because uh, in 2020, um, the Black Dragon team uh, actually knocked us out of the tournament. So this was uh, a huge rematch for us and allowed us to continue on in the tournament. Um, I realized I never introduced which robot was ours. Um, if it wasn't obvious, we are the green frog themed robot. Um, we have been competing since 2019 uh, and have competed in every BattleBot season since. Um, and like I mentioned previously, the hits that you're seeing in slow motion here really uh, don't do the size of the robots justice. Uh, they look like toys. They, they look like they're getting thrown around like they don't weigh very much. However, in real life, I promise you they're all 250 pounds. So um, you've seen what we can do on the TV show BattleBots, but how exactly did we start? Um, the entirety of the team are actually WPI students ranging from the class of 2019 to uh, 2022. Uh, so we all met in school and we started competing in the Northeast circuit uh, in the one pound, three pound, 12 pound and 30 pound classes. Um, these local competitions really allowed us to develop our skills, um, both as engineers and specifically as combat robotics competitors. So here on the left, I have an example video from 2016. This is uh, from one of our first ever events in the three pound weight class. Um, so the orange robot is my one of my first robots called Bumblebee. Um, it's like I said, a three pound robot. Um, however, unlike the BattleBots, a lot of these robots were made with uh, homegrown tools. So the hammer bot you see there in white is actually using the tip of a screwdriver as the tip of his hammer. Um, and my robot with uh, that black drum spinner on the front is actually just a painted section of pipe. So in the early days, earlier days of combat robotics, there was definitely a lot of uh, MacGyvering solutions and using whatever you had lying around. So that's kind of the beginnings of our um, combat robotics career. However, since then, we've moved on to uh, both greater production value and larger robots. So this robot in orange and green is our 30 pound robot. You can see Cam standing on the left there. This robot competes at Norwalk, Connecticut um, at a local competition with incredible production value. Um, and one really fun thing that you can notice here is instead of using wheels, it's using these little red feet. Um, and because it technically doesn't use wheeled locomotion, it's uh, given a one and a half times weight bonus. So instead of being 30 pounds, this robot is actually a little heavier than 45. Um, there, are, there are a couple specific rules to this competition that give us um, extra weight bonuses. We figured we'd show this fight because it's a pretty great example of ultimate destruction. Uh, we applied and were accepted to the full TV show of BattleBots in 2019 and have been competing since. Now, one of the things that makes Team Robot really unique in the entire field of BattleBots competitors is the fact that we run exclusively custom motor controllers. A lot of teams use off-the-shelf uh, components which aren't designed for combat, and as a result, they'll see failures where these off-the-shelf um, parts are not robust enough to deal with the forces that these robots see in the battle box. We, although we use custom now, we weren't always that way. Um, I'm sure you all noticed that photo on the left. Uh, that photo comes from RoboGames 2018. Uh, this was the team's first attempt at a heavier weight class robot. And unfortunately, that was not after a match. That was actually right before our match started. Nick went to turn on the robot for our first ever match with that bot, and it just spontaneously combusted. To this day, we're not sure exactly what happened. However, our theory is something went wrong uh, while initializing in one of our off-the-shelf controllers, and that resulted in the fire that you see there. Since then, we took those lessons from that robot and decided that off-the-shelf controllers were not worth it. And we designed um, fully custom solutions for every season of BattleBots um, since then. Uh, in the middle here, you can see the team uh, hand assembling our first revision of brushed motor controllers in 2019. These were used throughout the entire robot where we used brushed motors on both the weapon and the drivetrain uh, with the exact same motor controller.
Since then, we've branched out. Our drivetrain still uses uh, a brushed solution. However, our weapon now uses our own custom brushless solution. We are very happy to say that we haven't regretted the decision to go custom. We believe that it really gives us a competitive advantage in the battle box, and our fight history has kind of shown that off. So when we first designed our brush controllers, we weren't actually using Altium Designer or Altium 365. Uh, we were using um, an open source ECAD tool called KiCAD. Many of you may be familiar with it. It's great for, for entry level projects. It can be used on even more advanced boards. You know, the drive for us was at, le at least myself as a student was, it was an easy open source uh, tool to get into um, to make boards. But we, we learned through our, our design attempts and iterations that this tool doesn't include a great workflow for integrating with MCAD and, and mechanically integrating your, your PCB with your whole system. So this tool doesn't include a very tightly knit workflow for exporting to MCAD. So the, the workflow is basically you export a step file, you send this to your mechanical engineer, he has to import it into the project, and he's essentially making a new copy of the board every time it's imported into the tool of choice. For our, our use, we use SolidWorks. So this means importing a step into SolidWorks. And then maybe this means we need to go put this board back into the assembly. We need to remate everything. We any Anything that's defined in the assembly that's in relationship to this board, basically it's broken. And it's, it's a, a very slow process that requires a lot of like tedious work repeatedly, especially if you're iterating. And so once, once the MCAD changes are made, then the question is, well, if there were MCAD changes that required ECAD changes, say you needed to move a connector. So how do you, how do you do that with this tool? And our, our workflow was essentially you either tell the ECAD engineer or myself in this example, how, how much they need to move a connector, for example, and they would manually do that in their ECAD tool, or you could provide a DXF, say there were a lot of changes, there's a board outline change, you know, there's a handful of component changes, you'd have to manually import that DXF into your ECAD tool. And then you'd have to figure out how to actually move the components. And there can be a lot of errors in this as essentially just manually moving the components to match what the DXF says. If you're exporting like centroids of components in the DXF or your board outline. So there's, there's really just this lack of iteration between ECAD and MCAD. So this slide shows an overview of how we use uh, Altium 365. Uh, this overall process will probably seem familiar to a lot of you uh, if you do a lot of PCB design on a daily basis. First off, we start with conceptual design. Uh, we identify what the purpose of our PCB is, whether it's a motor controller, whether it's an e-fuse, what is this board supposed to do? What are the inputs and outputs? and how does it play into our overall system design. Also as a part of this step, we will research key components. Uh, this could be a microcontroller, MOSFETs, uh, key components that determine the performance of the final finished product. After that, we will uh, take these components that we've selected uh, and we'll create them. Uh, we'll create symbols and footprints, which we'll use later in the process. After we've created all these components, we'll move on to schematic creation. So we'll actually use our symbols, uh, lay out the circuit, uh, perform analysis as required to make sure the board will function as intended. Uh, the fourth step is usually the most time consuming and it can be quite iterative. It's the creation process and iteration between ECAD and MCAD. This is the, the step of the process where we think Altium 365 is pretty awesome. It'll start by ECAD uh, creating the initial board and pushing it to MCAD. From there, uh, MCAD can update the board outline, uh, make changes as needed, uh, can add keepouts, uh, and can also position uh, shared components. In this case, shared components could be connectors or possibly large components that might impact the design of the enclosure. A good example of this is that last year on our board, uh, we had some large electrolytic capacitors, uh, and the position of those capacitors was pretty relevant to the design of the enclosure. So it's possible for the MCAD to place those components and communicate that very easily to the ECAD designer. As part of this process, uh, we can pass the board back and forth as many times as we want, and we will show a demo of that very shortly. After both the MCAD and the ECAD and any other relevant parties have approved of the board design, 
uh, we can proceed to uh, prototype production. So we can uh, order the parts uh, based on the bomb, and then we can procure a small quantity of boards for prototyping uh, and to ensure that the board uh, meets the functional requirements. So here's a, a slide that just gives like a brief overview of some of the, the projects we've worked on and integrated tightly between MCAT and ECAD with Altium 365. So in the top center is actually our custom brushless controller that was used in the fight you just saw. This, this controller was a, you know, originally designed to, uh, to fix some of the issues we had from a previous iteration. Our, our main goal for this, this update, we, we essentially redesign a motor controller almost every year. So we, we go through a ton of iteration and, uh, and just change of design um, throughout. So one of our, our biggest concerns from our 2020 season um, was the mechanical shock that we were experiencing on our control board, our, our motor controller. Um, the motor, the, the control board was mounted to the, the rear of the motor, similar to what you see in kind of the bottom right picture. We didn't take too many considerations on the impact load that the, the module and control board were taking. Um, so as a result, we actually experienced failures and fights where boards that we thought were secured well enough to uh, mechanical components uh, were, were actually shearing components off, you know, capacitors are flying off boards, uh, legs were breaking, entire modules that are very large, like 80 millimeter by 40 millimeter modules with 60 pins, all the pins would be bent. So there's just, just incredible shock loads in these fights. You're, you're seeing hundreds, if not thousands of Gs um, on these impacts. So this, this tool allows us to tightly integrate our mechanical design. And we, we go through a lot of iteration, mainly because our mechanical and electrical design are very time constrained. We have only a couple of weeks to design our robot and our controllers and all the subsystems we have in them. And generally speaking, we need to get it right on the first time. We don't actually have enough time to, to go through more than two iterations. We, we usually get it right on the first time. It's very difficult, but I don't see us having enough time to go through three iterations to get it right. So that means we'll, we'll have the MCAD and ECAD almost designed at the same time. And that the Altium 365 tool and the co-designer allows us to just quickly pass more designs to MCAD, to ECAD. MCAD can move critical components, mounting holes, MOSFETs, anything that's relevant for, like, for example, integration with uh, our heat exchanger. As you can see in the, in the top right photo, this controller has a, a water cooler on it. And Altium 365 made this incredibly easy to position all of these mounting holes, the tolerance stack up for the topside cooled MOSFETs to the heat exchanger. That was a very tightly controlled um, tolerance. And then all the components around it needed to be nested as close as possible to reduce inductance in the power stage. And then on top of that, you know, we have to quickly iterate a housing to work around this controller. So Altium 365 really helps us both on the MCAD and ECAD side to, to just stay up to date and then to be able to very quickly send changes between the two tools. And you'll see, see a demo of this in our video where we're passing the boards back and forth and all the communication really is, is you know, it could be purely be done in the comments used to push, uh, the comments used when you push changes, or you can talk directly to an engineer, but you, there's no more of this handing of files or locations, um, centroids. It's really all taken care of in the program, and both programs work natively with the files. So SolidWorks doesn't have to re-import, mates aren't broken, features stay. It's it's pretty much ideal. Yeah, and so some of the other designs that are shown here. Um, our wireless telemetry system is in the bottom center. We had a, kind of an off-season prototype controller that was used in the 30-pound robot in the bottom left. And then a current project is the bottom right, which is, <laughs> I know I just said, we took the controller off of the ES, or off of the motor and isolated it. We're now attempting to go back and put the controller back on the motor with some more mechanical and shock considerations. So there was actually an issue with uh, moving the controller off board, which was the signal integrity of the position sensor that's required on the motor. 
So there are these trade-offs, right? And there's almost no way to really know until you iterate. So having a tool that can quickly that that can let you quickly iterate is is crucial for our very time constrained development. So we're about to show you a, a demonstration of kind of the workflow that we use um, in Altium and in SolidWorks uh, as we design enclosures for our um, electronics. We are going to be presenting a new board design that we are working on. This is an e-fuse board that we are going to be using in our motor controller development to prevent electrical fires. This board is designed to allow us to monitor voltage and current inputs and outputs to our controllers. It also allows us to set software adjustable current limits and disconnect power quickly during overcurrent events. This board consists of a handful of MOSFETs, current shunt, a current amplifier, a microcontroller, some power regulation, a gate driver for the MOSFETs, and a CAN transceiver so we can offload data to other systems. I've already imported the components and gave the board a rough outline. Because this board is a development tool, the mechanical design restrictions are lesser, and a simple board outline was picked. I'm now going to pass the board to Cam, where he can design a housing and provide feedback on hole placement, connector placement, and board outline. I can go ahead and open the co-designer tab, and then I can write my message to Cam so that he's aware of what I changed. Once my message is complete, I can hit the send button. Altium 365 MCAD co-designer will then process the changes, and they will be sent to Cam over in SolidWorks. I just received the board outline from Nick, and I see that I have a notification from CoDesigner indicating that changes to the board have been made. I am going to pull these changes and see if there are any updates to the board that might impact the mechanical design. It looks like Nick has moved a couple of items. Uh, I'm going to accept these changes. While the file is updating, we can see that the board outline, the graphics, and some of the components will move uh, based on the changes that Nick has implemented. Based on the preliminary board dimensions that Nick provided me with, I was able to start modeling up this case for use in a lab environment. The basic idea is that the board bolts to these five mounting locations on the case. The majority of the primary side components fit within this pocket in the enclosure design. This allows us to make use of the component height on the primary side to feature tapped holes in our enclosure design so that we can mount the board. Notionally, this enclosure design will be 3D printed and brass inserts will be used to create threaded inserts in the enclosure. The entire enclosure looks like this. If we hide the top of the case, we can see the e-fuse board. It looks like currently we have a couple of issues. We have an interference in the corners where the case has a radius and the board does not. In addition, it looks like in some cases some of the components that have been placed are quite close to some of our mounting features. After reviewing the fit of the board design in the enclosure, there are a few updates that we need to make. First off, we can start with adding fillets in the corners of the board. To do this, we can open the board, and we can go into the board sketch. What's nice is that we selected some uh, very easy to work with numbers to get us started. We can come up here to the fillet tool, and add some fillets. Next, if we go back to the board assembly, we should probably add some keepouts to alert Nick to the fact that not all of the board space is usable for component placement. To do this, we can use the keepout area feature. 
I've already created a couple of sketches in this board to make it easy. We will select a sketch that is closed and click Keep Out Area. From there, we can click the top surface of the board and an appropriate distance. Now that we've added all five of our keep out areas, we can proceed to the last update that we need to make to the board. We need to move this connector such that it aligns with the cutout in the enclosure. To do this, we can move this connector to the ideal position for the MCAD design. We can go to Mate. We can click the center axis of this component and we can constrain it relative to the board. It's clear that Nick will likely have to make a few updates for new component placements. However, if we go to the enclosure assembly, we will see that now the connector aligns with the cutout in the enclosure. Now that we've implemented the updates to the mechanical aspects of the board design, we can push these changes over to Nick. To do this, I'll open up the board assembly Here, we've actually added the top and bottom pieces of the enclosure, and we'll push these as part of our updates to the mechanical design. After I've added a comment to describe my changes, I can simply click Send to push these changes to Nick. So I've received the changes from Cam. I can go to the co-designer tab and press Pull to pull in the new changes. I can highlight over to see what's actually changed. So the board design has been updated. The outline has fillets. The connector has been moved. There's an enclosure body that's been added and keep out zones. So I can press apply and approve all these changes. So the changes import very quickly. And the housing is now present in the ECAD. I can change the transparency so that I can see the parts. So I know that I need to move these components, move this CAN transceiver out of this keep out zone on these polygons up here, I need to re-pour and bring the copper out of this region. This keep out zone has both this current sense amplifier and this shunt that's in the way. So I can make those updates and then push it back to cam. So I'm going to start by moving this CAN transceiver a little bit uh, to the left, so I can get some room around the clearance, the, the uh, mounting hole, and then just remove all the connections, um, delete some of the vias so I can kind of rework this area. Um, shelving the polygon, the ground pour, helps just not click on the ground pour while I'm rerouting and um, replacing components. I can use the selection filter to assist and making sure that I select the component I want. It's a useful filter for when you have a lot of objects kind of on the same same area. Picking out, say, a via specifically, the selection filter can really help with that. Um, and move this a little bit more so I can give myself enough room. Um, just work on a rough alignment of traces right now and I need to relocate these termination resistors for the CAN connection 
Um, I can try on this side, but it looks like it's going to be really close to this crystal. So I might actually try putting this on the other side of the connector, so I have a bit more room here. And I can orient this connector so that uh, the um, stabilizing capacitor has good connection to both, and that the um, terminating resistors are routed relatively symmetrical. Um, for this uh, low speed can, the routing's not too critical of these termination resistors. I can just kind of roughly use the differential tool to route these differential pairs, then connect the stabilizing cap to the center, center tap of these termination resistors. Then I'm going to need to um, connect my bypass capacitor, this CAN transceiver back up, and it's looking like I'll run out of room if I want to drop my vias for this capacitor. So I'm just going to pull this transceiver up a little bit, give myself a little more room from the edge of the board. I can change my grid so that these vias are pretty close to each other and get good decoupling. Just kind of use the gloss tool to fix these traces up. And that looks pretty good for now. I can turn my attention to this shunt. It's at the, the high side of the output and I'm just going to delete all these vias so that I can kind of move this uh, resistor a little bit easier and then I can place the vias again after. Sort of select this group and start with just feeling where this resistor needs to go. Um, I keep it mostly centered still. Um, then I can just move this um, amplifier up a little bit closer to the, the shunt. It looks like I mostly moved pretty well. There's just some cleanup on the traces. And then um, it's like when I move the vias, they got connected, so I can just delete that extra trace. The vias. It's pretty good for placement. And then I can uh, restore my polygon. I can clean up the, the vias a little bit later. Now that I've finished updating the board from the changes that Cam sent over, I can push the board back to Cam and then he can check for final fitment in the housing, verify that all connectors, all components are placed correctly. And open the co-designer tab, create a message to send to him, let him know that we're pushing for final fit check. He should check for all housing interferences and all the changes that we made. Now Cam will receive a notification on his side to check. Nick let me know that he pushed his changes that he implemented to the board. I can see that on the right because of this blue banner. He commented pushing for final fit check. I can pull these changes and take a look at specifically what changed. It looks like Nick moved a couple components and the board decals have changed as well. I can apply these changes and take a look at how they impact the fit of the board at the next higher assembly. Now the changes to the board have been implemented. 
Now that we've pulled the changes to the board design, we can take a look at the next tire assembly and look at how these changes have impacted the mechanical fit at the enclosure. To start off, we can see that Nick has moved the connector to the desired location, and it now aligns with the cutout in the enclosure. If we hide the top of the enclosure, we can see that the board outline has changed, and it now fits within the pocket in the case. In addition, we can see that there are no components within our keypad areas, and Nick has also updated the flood geometry so there's no exposed copper in the area of our keypad. It looks like the board now fits in the enclosure. Our next steps for this board will be to procure the raw PCB, procure the components, and 3D print the enclosure. So I hope you enjoyed that little demo. Um, next, we're going to go through a uh, very quick Q&A from some of the questions that viewers submitted uh, during registration. So question one, uh, how do you stop uh, the detailed ECAD model from slowing down the MCAD tool? This is a great question. Um, and this is something that um, I've experienced in industry. For the motor controller designs that we've done to date, we don't typically have too many components, don't have you know close to 2,000. I've noticed that even on boards that have 200 components can be a little slow. Um, and one of the techniques that we've used in the past is to simplify the geometry of components. So um, like for 0402s, 0603s, to have value in the MCAD model, um, they don't need to have a ton of detail like um, solder fillets, um, different colors, fancy geometry for the terminals, really just a rectangle, rectangular prism will do. Um, I've also seen that for gullwing devices, in order to export a smaller file, we have simplified the geometry just into rectangular prisms. They look a little funny, but ultimately they achieve the same desired effect that the MCAD designer can check for fit issues um, at the next higher assembly. So I would recommend trying to simplify the model that uh, is being pulled into MCAD. For the next question, what is the most challenging part of Ribot you've had to optimize? Motor, boards, weight, strength. How long did it take you to be happy with the optimization? What are you looking for to improve next season? So I'd say, at least in terms of the controller, I'd say the hardest part to optimize was the, the power stage layout in terms of meeting our thermal design profile, uh, minimizing inductance, and then just our, our space constraint. It's, it's, you know, we need to uh, make it as light as possible, as small as possible, and then as robust as possible. Now, how long did it take, us for, take for us to be happy? A couple of weeks, we don't have too much time. So uh, you gotta be happy the first time. And then improvements for next season, I'd say the, the biggest issue we saw was the encoder to the, the, between the motor uh, and the control board. We need to improve the signal handling and the um, uh, just the connection so that we're not getting bad data. Question three, what is the wireless protocol you use for your telemetry system? So it's a proprietary um, 2.4 gigahertz based uh, frequency shift keying modulation scheme. And then we time divide, we use uh, TDMA to time divide time slices uh, between all the devices as we like to have each controller have its own time slice and that all, all information can be sent back to an off-board, off-robot system to be viewed in real time and then logged for analysis after the match. Um, so this question about uh, the rotational hammer bots, uh, a lot of uh, robots that are hammers don't actually use an electrical system to um, survive the impacts. So Beta, one of the most famous hammers, actually uses a fully pneumatic system, uh, so they don't have to deal with motor controllers at all. Um, and Shatter uses a mechanical clutch to allow, some, allow for some slip and not have to backdrive the system as hard. In terms of what we use for better signal, Team Robot sticks our antennas out of our top plate. Um, we ran into an issue once where we trapped our signal antennas inside of a metal box. And as you can imagine, uh, that didn't work out so well. So now we have them very slightly externally mounted. With regards to design compromises that we've made between the mechanical and electrical design, a great example of this is the undercutter module, uh, which is actually on the uh, background of my screen. The design of the motor assembly 
uh, was quite long. And this is because the motor itself, its form factor uh, is slightly long. Uh, in addition, uh, a gear reduction is required uh, to obtain the desired RPM for the undercutter spinner itself. And in addition to that, when the module was first designed, the motor controller was mounted to the rear of the motor. So that further increased the length of the overall assembly. Uh, for that reason, instead of mounting the axis of the motor parallel with the axis that the undercutter spins, uh, we actually had to rotate it 90 degrees and use bevel gears in order to drive the undercutter. Um, so this was required, you know, based on the design of the motor, motor controller, and the required gear ratio. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the system has worked well. So six, when the vertical spinner hits an object, how do you stop the back EMF or current from destroying the motor? Is production already in the driver electronics is added? So essentially, we we take multiple paths to this. Um, the big biggest mitigation is actually the mechanical powertrain how we connect the motors to the weapon. Um, we choose to do it through belts that are not toothed, so they actually slip and it just increases the time. Essentially, the, the response that the motor has, it doesn't have to slow down as fast. And then in terms of the controller uh, protection, really, we don't have anything specific. We just have fast running control loops that are optimized for transients, essentially. Question seven, uh, best practices for sketch constraints in SolidWorks? I would say as long as you don't update the board outline in ECAD, the constraints that you create in MCAD should remain. Um, if you desire to be able to modify that geometry, I'd recommend using the native SOLIDWORKS tools, tangent, perpendicular, um, dimensions, in order to be able to maintain design flexibility as you go. I also have some experience using a 2D drafting tool, AutoCAD. Uh, and it is possible to uh, copy and paste a 2D sketch into a SOLIDWORKS sketch. Uh, and from there, if the board geometry is very complex, you can actually just fix it in SOLIDWORKS. There could be some debate about you know, controlling the design. Is that in the AutoCAD domain or the SOLIDWORKS domain? Um, but ultimately, if the, if the board outline needs to be very complex, then that is a viable option. Uh, with regards to question eight, this is an issue that we've experienced in the past. Uh, Nick alluded to it uh, previously. We've kind of tackled it from a couple different perspectives. Like Nick mentioned, if you isolate the board from uh, the motor controller or the structure of the robot, then it allows you to dampen the input from collisions with other objects, robots, your spinner, things of that nature. So generally, we'll use uh, rubber dampening methods within the structure of the robot to be able to isolate it. In addition, when we're doing component selection, we take a look at uh, large components very carefully Big capacitors sometimes can have failure modes internal to the capacitor, so we, we try to use some caution when we're selecting components. Another common practice in industry is to stake components. So we've started doing that in the last couple seasons. Um, actually, you know, epoxying components to the board uh, is, a, is a really effective method for uh, preventing components from coming off the board. And um, the factors there are related to size and mass of the components. So we'll use staking uh, as needed to, to mitigate against uh, the shock impacts. Um, so we've done a little bit over time. We will make sure to get back to uh, all those who ask questions over email. Um, but thank you for joining us today. I will be handing this back over to Grace. Thank you, Team Rebot for um, sharing your experience in designing and building your combat robots and how LTM365 and MK co-design involves in your journey. And thank you for attending the webinar. Hope you gained some valuable information from it. Um, the recording of the webinar will be shared with you shortly. Thank you again and um, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>